Okay. All right. So that's my introduction. Welcome to Grand Rounds, everyone. So thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Vélez, uh, sorry, whom I've known for a number of years. He's currently the chief of nephrology at the Oshner program in uh, uh, New Orleans. And also, I reading the CV, I heard it's professor at the University of Queensland in Australia, or some kind of affiliation. He's originally from Peru, started his career here in Chicago at Illinois Masonic, and uh, then went uh, to a fellowship at Emory, two years clinical, one uh, research fellowship, then to South Carolina as an attending for about a decade, became a C associate professor, and then in the last uh, three years or so, he's been at uh, Tulane, where he's the chief of nephrology. Very productive as a writer, even though he's very busy rounding for month a year, etc. I've followed his career, his publications, very diverse. His main topic is hepatorenal syndrome, which we are going to hear about today. But he, I want to highlight that during the pandemic, uh, New Orleans got hit very hard, and he was uh, among the very first to publish series of AKI, but also the collapsing uh, FSGS, and I think he gets the credit for a paper that is entitled Coven is the New Haven, and the term uh, Coven, I think, is his uh, uh, terminology. So it's nice to have a publication that everyone can remember. So the hour is late. I don't know whether I was going to say anything else, except to say that uh, yesterday the fellows had the opportunity to have a, a tutorial on the UA. This is one of the areas that he's now going to write a book about that. At least I encourage to not so much tweeting, Twitters. Uh, we are both complaining now. That he's been on Twitter forever. I, when I, I was becoming excited with Twitter now, it seems that Twitter is going down. But it's time to write a book on the UA so that these beautiful images are collected in a book. And thank you to all the fellows for spending time with him yesterday. The topic for today is either hepatorrenal or cirrhosis, and a AKI in cirrhosis patients. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Danielle. Quite an honor to be here at Northwestern University. I appreciate the invitation. Um, and uh, since we mentioned COVID, I should also give credit to Dr. Pellick, who wrote one of the first reports on COVID uh, before our case series. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, uh, um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about AKI and cirrhosis and hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, kind of share with you the perspective about this complex topic. Uh, and hopefully we can come up with some uh, interesting uh, conclusions for your, for your practice. Uh, here's my disclosure pertinent to this talk. That was part of the confirmed trial, a site investigator, sponsored for molecular pharmaceuticals. I'm also part of the advisory board for that company. The other relationships are not pertinent to this talk. Um, so we'll start with a case. I'll always start that. Uh, this is an individual, 53-year-old uh, patient with cirrhosis who arrives to the hospital, has uh, liver disease from alcohol, uh, creatinine 0 0.9 at baseline, is admitted with AKI. Uh, reason for admission was worsening jaundice. There was no diarrhea, no diuretics, no laxative to suggest a volume depleted state. The only medication was nadolol. Uh, to uh, prevention of variceal bleed. Uh, on examination, blood pressure 115 over 55, MAP of 75, uh, saturating 94% on Romare. Examination shows tense ascites, 2 plus edema, jaundice, nothing really out of ordinary for a decompensated patient with uh, cirrhosis. Creatinine 2.4, bilio of 13, urinary sodium less than 20. So uh, urine microscopy is performed and revealed this bilirubin stain hyaline casts as the only finding. So the question is, what's the next step here? Should we just get a fena? Should we start intravenous albumin? Uh, 
Should we start the cocktail of modern and octreotide? I'm sure you face this scenario in your practice. So we'll go through these questions later on. But let me just go back to this uh, report that I love from 1959. Solomon Pepper in Massachusetts reported a series of 22 individuals that were admitted to the hospital with cirrhosis and they developed AKI. They were admitted for various reasons, as you can see here, GI bleed, progressive jaundice. The common denominator, they all had AKI. Interesting in this report from the 1959, they reported urine microscopy was performed and it had some scattered granular casts or hyaline casts. It wasn't completely blend in all the cases. But it was common about them that every patient uh, ended up dying within the hospital stay with body coma and they actually perform autopsy in 18 of those 22 patients. And the tissue you can see here, still this is black and the days of black and white journals, you see that tubules are intact. There was absolutely no evidence of significant parenchymal damage, despite the fact that these individuals have died in an anuric state. So this is the beginning of the observation of a discrepancy between the degree of functional derangement and the degree of parenchymal injury. Um, Subsequently, uh, this report uh, from Denmark in 70 patients with cirrhosis, one of the first in vivo demonstration in human of actual measurements of renal blood flow. This is when they were able to puncture the femoral artery, go into the renal artery, and actually measure renal blood flow. The IRBs these days won't let us do that, for sure. And what they were able to show, Ring Larsen and his collaborators, is that you can see going from the left to the right, and representing a y-axis the renal blood flow. You can see going from a patient from a control, from a patient with compensated cirrhosis, from a patient with ascites, all the way to the cirrhotic with azotemia and oliguria, there was a remarkable progression for following renal blood flow. Um, so this is the, sort of the early study that showed this is a function disorder characterized by renal uh, 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 blood flow reduction. And we're not going to expand too much today on pathogenesis. I have that slide, and I'm going to try to summarize to you what we think is the, the main story regarding the pathogenesis for this uh, renal blood flow reduction in heparenal syndrome. It starts with the cirrhotic liver. You have a stiff liver with fibrosis. There's also an imbalance of basodilators, at least through intrahepatic risk vascular resistance. As a result of that, there's a maladaptive response outside the liver that leads to release of nitric oxide primarily and vasodilation of mesenteric vessels. This is called a splackening arterial vasodilation. We also have bacterial translocation, release of endotoxin that further releases nitric oxide. And we also have vascular arterial growth factor release that leads to this development of collateral circulation of portosystemic shunting. All these three phenomena independently are going to lead to reduction in sustained vascular resistance, increase in cardiac output, but ultimately a reduction in the effective arterial blood volume. And when that happens, we have sensors in our body that are going to respond to that. You have baroreceptor stretch that are going to lead to activation of the uh, sympathetic nervous system, signal to the brain, which is going to activate your renal sympathetic nervous system, release catecholamines, primarily norepinephrine, and lead to renal vasoconstriction. At the same time, you have the glomerular afferent arterial, who's going to also sense this decreased effective arterial blood volume. And because we also have renal sympathetic nervous system, more release of norepinephrine, more of its constriction, but we also have catecholamine stimulating renin release, which is going to, uh, is also down through prostaglandins and ultimately is going to produce angiotensin II and further amplify the vasoconstrictive uh, phenomenon, both from catecholamines and angiotensin. We also have a hepatic ner sympathetic nervous system, which is going to signal straight from the brain back to the kidneys, what is called a hepatorenal reflex, which is going to further amplify the vasoconstriction independent of the systemic derangements. And finally, vascular reactivity. There's no pathogenesis slide out there without reactive oxygen species, of course, has been implicated. And that's just kind of what we understand today about HRS pathogenesis. But let's go back to the, to the case and the, and the bedside when we take care of this patient. So this is, has been the traditional view. They, they, they wanted us to kind of think about a sort of a three-way possibility in this patient with cirrhosis. Either you have perenal ATN of HRS, that has been, kind of, has been historically written. 
What I want to try to convey to you today is a little bit more complex than that. First of all, we know that parietal and ATN live sort of a ends of a spectrum. There might be some overlap between them. I think that's fairly well accepted outside cirrhosis, but it also applies to cirrhosis. And I also like to uh, submit the idea that HRS and ATN is also sort of an ends of a spectrum. There might be a situation when you may catch a patient at a stage where there is some hepatorenal physiology and ATN may be evolving or is present at the same time. But we also have to remember some other aspects of the patient with decompensated cirrhosis. There's something called abdominal compartment syndrome. We know these patients can have tense ascites. Is that going to play a role in the cause of AKI that can overlap with HRS? We also know cardiorenal syndrome type 1 uh, has to be discussed. I'll touch on that a little bit later in the talk in the context of cirrhosis, why this is relevant. And we also have to remember that at the end of the day, these patients are also vulnerable for acute pneumonephritis, acute interstitial nephritis, obstructive uropathy. They tend to be less common, but we cannot just ignore them. And finally, Chronic kidney disease could be present at the time of evaluation, particularly these days when we have this uh, metabolic syndrome and NASH growing in, as an epidemic. We do have more patients that arrive with a pre existing CKD, which is going to add complexity to your assessment. So what we have today is to try to navigate this complex uh, scenario where we have multiple possibilities and we're trying to determine who has hepatorenal syndrome, we have historically used the International Club of Ascites <laughs> criteria. This is the latest version, 2015. There's a new version, should come out later this year. Uh, there was a meeting earlier in San Diego in 2023. Um, so the first thing to recognize is that the ICA, the, the Club of Ascites recognized that they needed to adapt the KDGO definition of AKI. It wasn't present. You go back to the old criteria of HRS and they use absolute values of creatinine, it had to be above 2.5, which we know today is obsolete. Uh, so they applied to KDGO, I think we're happy with that. We use changes in renal function based on that. One of the criteria talks about shock. So how do you define shock in a patient with cirrhosis? We often see patients that are arrived to the hospital, they're still alert and oriented, blood pressure is 85 or 45 with a map of 58. Uh, and you may have a patient with a map of 52 and the next patient with a map of 60. And ultimately, the patients are started on a presser depending on who's treating the patient. It becomes sort of a, a therapeutic decision. When you, whenever you start a presser, you're calling that patient a shock. We don't really have sort of an, another definition based on lactic production or anything like that. So it's a little bit of an, a gray zone for sure, particularly because these patients tend to have low blood pressures to begin with. The criteria also says if you have greater than 50 RBCs uh, per high power field, that's too much hematuria, you cannot have HRS. Well, what about the fact that some of these patients may have IgA nephropathy, which is the secondary cirrhosis, the most common cause of secondary IgA is cirrhosis. What about if a patient has a folic catheter? How are you gonna interpret that hematuria? And what about the morphology of the red blood cells? If they are dysmorphic, they are isomorphic, Shouldn't that count into the assessment? And finally, why 50? What is the magic about 50? What about 20, 10 RBCs per heartbeat? Is that okay? Is that not suggestive of any other nephritic process? So you can see the problem there from the nephrology perspective. They also call for proteinuria greater than 500 milligrams per day. Who measures 24 hour urine protein in the context of AKI and cirrhosis? I don't think we do. We try to use ratios, which we know are flawed, but at least give us an idea of what's going on in that context. Abnormal kidney ultrasound. So your kidney ultrasound has to be normal. Well, when you actually ultrasound a patient, uh, a kidneys of a patient with ascites, you're gonna have a large column of fluid on top of the kidney, which is gonna generate this acoustic enhancement. So, so how are you gonna assess the renal parenchyma really in the context of that? So the renal ultrasound is really not an easy variable to say is normal or is not normal. And they also say they cannot be exposed to nephrotoxin. I mean, and my answer to that is always, really? <laughs> These patients are usually treated with infections with antibiotics. We don't have a good way to be certain if the antibiotic is the culprit or not for the rising creatinine if the patient arrived to the hospital with normal creatinine. So there's a little bit of uncertainty as well. And 
the fraction of excretion of sodium in the urinary sodium have had an interesting story in this criteria. If you go back to the definitions in the late 1990s, you had to have a urine sodium less than 10. Somehow, throughout the last, the following 10, 15 years, it was removed. It was not considered necessary. And we in the front, we like renal physiology. We tend to think that we should pay attention. The question is, how much attention should we put? Some of the newer uh, uh, guidelines are proposing that we should use a lower threshold for phenol. I'm going to show you a little bit of that data as well. Engal is another marketing process, but we don't really have it for clinical use, so we're not going to discuss it today. But ultimately, when these patients arrive, before we jump in all these criteria, what the ICA requires us is to rule out that these patients don't have simply volume depletion. They want us to just stop diuretics, stop thinking, give them albumin, close your eyes, come back two days later and reassess. That's literally what the criteria calls for. And... First of all, let's just kind of support what is the rationale for that. And the reason is that these patients are indeed vulnerable for volume depletion. They are on laxatives, they are on diuretics. So it's not unreasonable to be suspicious of the most common cause. And why albumin is because albumin has demonstrated in different contexts in cirrhosis to be a better fluid expander than normal saline. This is a study looking at post paracentesis circulatory dysfunction, which is measured as increasing plasma renin activity, and it showed that albumin was associated with less incidence of this circulatory dysfunction compared to saline in a study in Barcelona in 2003. Dr. Batia may appreciate a lot of studies from Barcelona we're going to share today. And then we also have this post-peritonitis AKI, the famous SORT paper also from Barcelona published in Neuro General Medicine that showed that albumin added to the antibiotics reduced the development of AKI in, in patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And there are other lines of evidence, but these are two good examples. It makes sense, albumin should be better than saline, and we should consider using it. But now we have to start thinking about the potential risks or harms that could be caused by albumin. And one of the uh, recent studies that gave us a hint was the entire trial. This is published in Neural and Drug Medicine, a study that looked at normalization of albumin. Should we normalize the albumin to try to save lives? That's essentially what we're trying to do by giving intravenous albumin to these patients with cirrhosis. These were not AKI patients. And at the end of the study, they didn't show any benefit, but they showed that the incidence of pulmonary edema at fluid overload went from 2% in the untreated group compared to 6% on the patients that receive albumin. So it not only didn't help, that it created some potential harm. And we had already uh, kind of started looking at this uh, idea of reassessing the notion that every patient with cirrhosis and AKI needs to receive albumin. When I uh, partnered with my colleagues at the time, Terry Huggins and Nathan Karakala, and looked, essentially the question was, these were patients that were, we were consulted in the hospital for AKI, and the team, the primary team, had already deemed them uvolemic and consistent with HRS. So we went to the bedside, and they did, uh, my collaborators, and performed a point of care ultrasound looking at the IVC diameter. Bottom line is that about a third of the patients were, in fact, still volume depleted. About a third of the patients were indeed uvolemic, as deemed by the primary team and 34% were actually hypervolemic, either uh, by uh, having evidence of, of, of uh, pulmonary edema in addition to the point of care ultrasound management or patients that also have um, tense ascites. And about a quarter of those patients actually improved kidney function by either giving them more albumin or by diuresing them. So sort of put in the question that this blind administration of albumin needs to be reassessed. Now, what is the real point of us going through this sort of a differential diagnosis uh, exercise, which is very unique in cirrhosis compared to other settings of AKI? And it's because in cirrhosis, we have a specific diagnosis that is treated with a specific type of medication that is not applicable to any state. We don't treat ischemic ATN with vasoconstrictors. We don't treat AIN. That way. So this is why it's important, and I have shown you 
how the ICA criteria were built to try to help us go through that process, and I have pointed to you the challenges on those criteria. So is it really that simple that we could achieve this dichotomy and say HRS or not? So clearly there's more work to be done, and I'm just gonna share a couple of additional items that are not in the criteria, starting with the fraction excretion of sodium. Should we put it back into the criteria? This is a study by uh, my friend Hattie Wade at Jacksonville, Florida, Mayo Clinic there. They, this is a very powerful study. 88 subjects that underwent kidney biopsy as part of an evaluation for liver transplantation. 10 of these patients had normal kidneys. So they were diagnosed by a biopsy that they had HRS by definition. You may argue they were probably HRS type 2 because they were more chronic. Regardless, the fractional excretion of sodium was very low, less than 0.2%. In addition to this study, Justin Belcher at Yale, looking at the Tribe API Consortium data set, look at these 76 patients and looked at fractional excretion of sodium and also found that the patients with HRS had very low phenas, in this case 0.2. If you project uh, sort of the whisker plot imaginary, it will be about 0.3%. Now, these were a clinical diagnosis of HRS, not biopsy diagnosis. But again, we're getting an idea that in HRS, instead of saying 1%, should we lower it 0.3 or 0.2? We'll come back to this aspect when I show you our data adoption. And the other aspect that is not, has been sort of neglected in this assessment is setting a microscopy. I think you already know by now that I have special interest in urine sediment microscopy. I'm going to share with you a study by Andrew Allegretti at Massachusetts General Hospital. 79 patients looked at the ICA criteria, and based on that, he found 29% of patients who met the criteria for HRS. So they performed your microscopy, and when they found dark granular calf, they called them ATN. So 22% of the patients who had diagnosis of HRS by ICA criteria were subsequently recategorized as having ATN. So we actually are doing a similar approach at Oxford, led by our former resident Vivian Varghese, now he's a fellow up in Michigan. And we actually went beyond not just ICA criteria. We said, you have to have ICA criteria plus a urine sodium less than 20. And from those patients, we had 70 who met the criteria for HRS, who performed microscopy similar to Allegretti, and we found a very similar rate of conversion to ATN. So, it, it, it seems like about a quarter of the cases you're gonna meet, you, you may miss patients with ATN. And that would result on treating patients with a medication which we're gonna discuss later that is not a trivial decision. And it also, it's important to remember that your microscopy in cirrhosis is a little bit different than your standard patient because of the endogenous, you know, the, the pigmentation from the ruin, you may have past where you cannot tell if it's just a hyal and partially pigmented or a very muddy brown looking cast. So it requires extra care to look at this urine. You have this bilirubin stained renaturated tail cell cast very often. And of course, you may encounter these crystals. Just to point out that it's a little bit more difficult to, dice, to navigate through a urine of a patient with cirrhosis. So we'll go back to the case. Remember, this is a gentleman who was admitted with AKI from cirrhosis, creatinine went from 0.9 to 2.4. At this point, it met all the criteria for HRS, urine sodium less than 20, we were happy. Not all was discontinued because you know lowers blood pressure is not a good desired effect. Patient got albumin 25 grams today, moderate and octotide were started. I'm sure you have, you have probably uh, dealt with a patient like this and you can see the creatinine going progressively up in the course of four days. You can look at the miniature pressure essentially unchanged. Urine output is still under 800 ml per day. So I'm sure you have faced a scenario like this where you have treated patient with modern neuroptotide, you don't get too far with this approach. So let's very quickly review what are the potential uh, uh, pharmacological agents to treat HRS, starting with modern and octroidite, of course, and it's really, to me, uh, incredible how modern and octroidite has been so embedded in our practice with so little data to support it. 
And the trial is actually from Paolo and Jelly in 1999. It wasn't even a randomized controlled trial. It was a prospective non parallel trial where they treat, we treated eight patients with dopamine low dose and five patients with moderate neuroctotide. And of course, the patients with moderate neuroctotide did much better than the patients with dopamine. But the protocol of this trial was designed to raise blood pressure with moderate neuroctotide and to purposely not raise blood pressure with dopamine by using a low dose. So there was a difference of 60 minutes of mercury between the two groups. And that's what studied the show moderate than being effective. Terlipressin obviously has uh, been, we've been paying attention to terlipressin as a result of the confirmed trial. So I'm not gonna show you the entire breadth of literature with terlipressin, I'm gonna go straight to the to the last trial, which we participated at auction, we enrolled nine patients. This is a 300 patient, two to one randomization, two, not 199 randomized to depression, 101 to placebo, followed on 90 days, and essentially looking at HRS reversal as a primary endpoint, which was defined at two conservative creatinine, less than 1.5. And keep in mind that this is a very rigorous endpoint. You know, any clinical trial in AKI, if your endpoint is reduction or improvement in GFR and kidney function by 30, 50%. I think anybody would take that as a clinically relevant, but the FDA was still stuck with the old definitions in the 90s. So this was the endpoint that went on the trial. Bottom line is that 29% of the patients randomized to telepressin achieved the primary endpoint compared to 16% of placebo treated patients, which led to the FDA approval. Uh, we subsequently published a, a pool analysis of the three trials. The confirmed was the third North American trial. The second trial was the reverse. And the first trial was the OTO for one. All combined to 608 patients. And we looked at the rates of dialysis. You can see here, telepressin reduced need for dialysis compared to placebo at days 30, 60, and 90 as you can see here. So this is a powerful piece of data. We don't have any molecule in nephrology that reduces the rates of dialysis. Uh, so this is something to take into consideration. Now, the story is not complete with some but. And the but for telepressing was this signal for safety that came from the confirmed trial, which was that the patients that were randomized to telepressing and albumin had a three-fold increase in respiratory failure, growing from 3 to 10%. So this is certainly not to be taken lightly, and the reason why we have to be very careful patient selection. Let's go on to norepinephrine, the good old norepinephrine. There are a, about six to seven randomized controlled trials that have tested telepressin versus norepinephrine. I'm gonna show you a couple. The message is the same. They are very comparable. Here are two papers from India, Sharma, 40 patients looking at the incidence of HR reversal, norepinephrine versus telepressin. In both cases, 50%. Look at the changes in mean pressure. In both cases, went up to the same degree, so they have similar results. Trial by SYNC, similar outcomes, similar races in blood pressure. So that's kind of the message overall, that the efficacy wise, they're fairly comparable. Has anybody compared the good old modern octrotide against norepinephrine or against telepressin? The answer is yes. Not many studies, though. One from Egypt on the left showing that norepinephrine was superior to modern octrotide, and here on the right, the study showing that telepressin was superior to modern octrotide. And in both cases, modern octrotide did not raise blood pressure as beautifully as Paolo Angeli was able to do in, in his original paper. So going back to the case now, I think at this point, I try to provide some rationale to, to, sh to think that perhaps modern inoctotide was not effective in this case. We need to escalate. Should we do norepinephrine? Should we do terlipressin as an option? So this particular patient was initiated on intravenous norepinephrine, which requires that our institution transfer to the intensive care unit. And I know that's a real barrier, various, there are some areas on the West Coast that are actually able to do it in telemetry floor. Um, but our residential patient goes to the ICU, starts on norepinephrine, and at the same time, ascites was worsening, and it was a consideration about should we do paracentesis? Is paracentesis going to trigger the HRS and, and be actually detrimental 
uh, for that. So those were the two discussions. How are we going to use norepinephrine? How should we handle the paracentesis? So let me share with you, this is a meta-analysis that we published back in 2011 in partnership with uh, uh, my friend and very smart statistician, Paul Neitar. Essentially, we compile, we look at every prospective trial that has tested any visceroconstrictor for the treatment of HRS, whether it was modern enoctotide, telepressin, or epinephrine. We pull all those studies, for 500 patient data, 21 publications, and look at the relationship between mean arterial pressure rise and serum creatinine. And it was really remarkable how the kidney function improvement tightly correlated with raising blood pressure. So essentially, it seemed to be just all about blood pressure. It was also interesting to look at the mean arterial pressure at baseline for this subject. You know, we go patients in septic shock in the ICU and we look at maps of 65 of our goal. In this particular meta-analysis, the main maps was, are actually above 75. So important to realize that you don't have to be very, very hypotensive to potentially benefit from a further rise in mean arterial pressure. We subsequently verified this observation with actual patient data at MUSC in a single center, looking at whether it was mitral enoctotide treated or norepinephrine treated. You see that the further, the, the higher the increase in blood pressure, the further the decline in serum creatinine. So it's applicable to any vasoconstrictor, not specific for any of them. And more recently, we try to go further because the question we were getting always on clinical grounds is, oh, how high should we push the map? Should we push it five? Should we push it 10? Should we set up a goal of 85 or 80? So we try to get to that answer. And what we, the observation was that patients that had increases in MAP greater than 50 meters of mercury had greater chances of improvement of creatinine that were raised between 10 to 15. So it's obviously observational, but it's, it showed that the greater the map, the greater the likelihood of improvement in, in, in kidney function. We also looked at sort of a multivariate logistic regression to look at factors associated with improvement in creatinine, and not only changing MAP was associated, but also the choice of norepinephrine over modern enoctotide. And it's simple, you are more likely to raise blood pressure if you use norepinephrine. Then the following question is, we're talking about norepinephrine, and if you go back to my second or third slide, I was trying to show you how norepinephrine causes vasoconstriction in the renal circulation and actually causes the impairment of AKI. And now, 20 slides later, I'm trying to sell you the idea that I want to bring norepinephrine to treat the problem. So it's a little bit counterintuitive, but let me try to show you why we think that happens. So you have here the renal autoregulatory curve, how the kidneys maintain uh, the perfusion to the kidneys unchanged to different levels of changes in blood pressure, you here on the left side. As you can see here, you can change your map to a certain range and your GFR renal blood flow won't change because we have that renal autoregulation. What happens in cirrhosis is you have an overactivated renal angiotensin system and overactivated sympathetic nervous system, which are actually the players of the renal autoregulation. So you lose that regulation because you're sort of locked into this state. And the curve becomes a little bit more linear and a little bit lower compared to the baseline. So what happens is now your function is going to go down. And as your MAP goes down, your renal blood flow goes down and your creatinine goes up. So it becomes a very linear relationship. So when you bring a presser, what you're trying to do is essentially take advantage of the linear curve to push it above and still gain renal blood flow in a situation where without this context, your map, your renal blood flow would stay flat. At that point, your affected arterial blood volume, it's now reset. Your endogenous stimulus for angiotensin and sympathetic nervous system goes down, you can actually see in this patient when you treat norepinephrine, MAP goes up and you track the renal activity level and goes down as your MAP goes up. So you're sort of resetting the problem. Now, the other question at this point on this case, I mentioned to you that we were gonna start on norepinephrine, but there was also a question from the ICU team about this paracentesis and ascites, which brings to this concept of renal congestion that wasn't really uh, gaining a lot of attention in the past. So 
I'm going to start with this paper once again from Pierre Ginés in Barcelona, 1998, a seminal paper, 105 patients. This is the paper when they actually decided to give albumin at the time of paracentesis, wasn't a common practice before. And look at the answers of AKI. If you give albumin, 0% of patients develop AKI immediately after paracentesis compared to 11% of those who did not receive albumin. So think about it. In the context of albumin-treated paracentesis, AKI didn't happen. We also know from this literature from Germany, Thomas Ungelter, looking at 19 patients with cirrhosis in the ICU, he was able to show that by performing paracentesis and draining five liters of fluid, the intra-abdominal pressure went from 22 to nine centimeters centimeter of mercury, and at the same time, able to show an improvement in creatinine clearance, doing a four-hour clearance in the ICU. So we have evidence of actual improvement in kidney function. And then more recently, in 2020, Harry Serapati and Andrew Allegretti, once again, in Mass General, shared this very informative observational study of 102 patients with cirrhosis. They looked at what happened when these patients are in a hospital, they get tapped, and what happened in the 40 hours after the tap? How often do we see AKI? It was actually 5%. Not only that, 10% of the patients actually improved kidney function. So essentially, improvement in kidney function was twice more common than AKI after paracentesis, which kind of raises this question that paracentesis being essentially a trigger of HRS, as most textbooks claim. And finally, this study from uh, a European group from uh, Estonia and Portugal showed that looking at blood pressure measurements in the ICU in patients with cirrhosis, about a quarter of them had diagnosis of abdominal compartment syndrome. So I think we have to start rethinking about how we approach this uh, ascites in cirrhosis. So because of that, this patient was started on norepinephrine with the goal of increasing the MAP 15 millimeters above baseline, which is what we did. You can see here the creatinine started to stabilize, started to trend down, and paracentesis was performed at this time. You can see the urine output going from 795, doubling to 1500, and the patient got paracentesis. So we're all good, we're feeling comfortable, patients are going in the right direction, but of course the ICU team is never satisfied. Now they brought up, this patient, I don't care, creatinine is getting better, but we were they were concerned because of hypervolemia, increased hypoxia, they were not impressed with 1500 mLs of urine output. Please put this patient on dialysis. This is uh, really what happened in this case. So what should, we, what should be the approach at this time? Now, I mentioned to you earlier that cardiorenal syndrome may be part of the diagnostic puzzle in cirrhosis and AKI, and there is a reason for that. First of all, we have this portopulmonary hypertension. This is an entity well described. This is why patients that are candidates for liver transplantation have to undergo a, a right heart catheterization often to look for that, and the incidence of that goes from 6 to 23% based on studies from Asia or Europe. We also know something called cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. In cirrhosis, early on, you have this high output heart failure. Patients are hyperdynamic. Cardiac index goes up. But subsequently, there are descriptions of, of the development of diastolic dysfunction, electrical derangements, and they can develop this cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. So those are reasons why these patients may actually develop cardiorenal features. And it's also interesting to look at how often venous congestion is present in cirrhosis. So this is a study from Prem Kumar in India, looking at 76 patients. They went on for right heart cath. And what they showed, they were looking at the value of POCUS, but what I'm showing in this study is not so much of that. It's showing how often patients had a, C a CVP above 12, essentially half of the patients. These are not even patients with AKI. So imagine how often this would be in the context of AKI. So this idea that the majority of patients with cirrhosis at presentation arrive bone depleted, therefore we have to give albumin, is not supported by the evidence. Most of them are actually congested. And I also would like to share with you the practice that we have that every trial that has tested use of either madronototide, terlipressin, or norepinephrine compared to placebo the vasoconstrictor has been tested along with intravenous albumin, and they also tell us you gotta give albumin because if you don't give albumin, you're not gonna get as much benefit. That 
primarily comes from the paper by Ortega from Barcelona, once again. And this is actually a small study, only 21. This is not an RCT, this is an observational study, 21 patients. Eight got Terli, only seven had HRS1, the other one was HRS2. And 13 got the combination of terlipressin and albumin and look at renal function changes. And of course, they show that if you combine terlipressin and albumin, you're more likely to have HRS reversal. Sounds like a slam dunk, which you get over to everybody. However, if you look at actual paper and you look at the changes in MAP during the course of the trial, the patients who were randomized or not randomized, they received terlipressin alone, the MAP went from 64 to 60. So there is no paper in the literature that will show you the addition of albumin is helpful in the context of a successful rise in MAP. So really you have to think of albumin for every single patient and not to give it in, co in combination with telepressin for, or norepinephrine for every single patient. Going back to the case now, so we decided to stop albumin uh, at this time. Uh, the, critical care team had a point, the patient was hypoxic, but it wasn't enough. They were asking for dialysis. So the kidneys now were working, the creatinine is trending down, we're perfusing it better, the MAP is up there. Why not bring him back diuretics? We use diuretics in the concept of ischemic ATN. But sometimes that's perceived as a, as a really uh, not a wise decision because when you go through triggering events for HRS, you will read what can trigger HRS? It could be an infection, it could be diuretics, and you will read in textbooks that paracentesis can actually trigger HRS or diuretics can trigger HRS. So it seemed kind of going against your rationale. But this is what we did in this patient. You can see the creatinine going down, even with the four liter urine output, as long as you maintain the mean arterial pressure. So what we thought at the time is that once you restore renal perfusion, you're gonna use diuretics and obviously like to use in any case of AKI. And I think it's sort of a, a something that um, is still challenging to get uh, many to buy on this sort of physiological approach. Because of this case, we decided to look at our fellow at the time, Terrence Whitby, at how often, this is just a sort of a fluke of a case and maybe this doesn't apply. And if you give the diuretic, patients are going to, get, going to get worse. That was the concern, right? If you give diuretics, you put them back in HRS and the patients get worse. So we looked at the patients that have been treated with norepinephrine, that had a rise of MAP at least of five. Out of those 44 patients, we look at those who had, we had approached them in this way by giving them a loop diuretic on top of norepinephrine. We ended up with 20 patients. And we looked at not only how much we were able to increase the urine output, but also what happened to the kidney function. We wanna make sure that this was a safe intervention. So these were the patients, creatinines of 3.8, male scores of 32, median dose of furosemide, 160 milligrams per dose. So we you went for high dose of furosemide. And these are the results. On the left, you have changes in urine output in red before the patient was treated with anything, with yellow when norepinephrine was in initiated, and in green when the loop diuretic was added to norepinephrine. So you can see a remarkable increase in urine output, clearly significant with these 20 patients. And at the same time, we show that before norepinephrine, the kidney function was worsening, represented in red. Once we introduced norepinephrine for the first two days, the creatinine was able to be stabilized or improved in yellow. And during the course of the diuretic, the kidney function essentially was maintained. So there was no deterioration of the kidney function. This is a pretty safe intervention. In this cohort of 44 patients, we also try to look going back to the FINA. Remember I showed you this recent data showing that we should lower the threshold to 0.3. So this is a cohort of 39 patients and looking at the relationship between fraction excretion of sodium and a change in creatinine by day 14. So you can see here the FINAS, every single FINA is less than 1% because these patients were diagnosed with HRS. Goes from 0.1 all the way to 0.9%. If you try to see at what point every patient got better, you would only be seeing that at less than 0.2. So that kind of, you say, well, maybe that's what the data is coming from. 
But if you just looked at those patients who actually had a rising MAC of 10, essentially these were patients that you effectively treated them for HRS. In that setting, now you get a little bit more successful and your FINA up to 0.4% give you a successful response. But go look at above that, you still have patients with FINAs of 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 who had some improvement in kidney function. So it becomes a little tricky to say, I'm not gonna treat anybody. But if you say, okay, how many patients had at least 30% improvement in kidney function? In that case, you do have only those with FINAs below 0.5. So this is still under debate whether this is gonna be reintroduced but I'm trying to show you here because ultimately the best diagnosis of HRS is response to therapy. And this is how this data is analyzed. Here, going to the uromicroscopy aspect, I show you. This is an example of a patient that has abundant muddy brown cast and waxy cast. Anybody in this room would agree that the overt tubular injury should take you away from treating this patient for HRS. These patients were not treated for HRS. So HRS is ruled out. You don't offer norepinephrine or terlipressin. You have scenario where patients have completely bland sediment or may only see hyaline cats. So you feel strong about that. If everything else fits, you say, all right, this patient has HRS, I'm gonna treat this patient. But of course, nothing is always absolutely medicine. You're gonna have this middle ground group where, hey, you see a few cats, you're not sure it may be ATN or not but it's not exclusive. So you try to give the patient the benefit of the doubt, these patients were offered treatment. And that's exactly how it happened in our center. So out of those 44 patients, we looked at those who had a successful increasing MAP, and we looked at what happens when the response rates. So for those patients who had evidence of ATN, 27% of them got better. For evidence, for those who didn't have any evidence whatsoever, 63% got better. This is still a small sample size, but I'm gonna try to show you pieces of evidence to take the functional evaluation of the API with the FINA and the injury evaluation with the sediment, perhaps in combination, it will help us decide better who should be treated with a vasoconstrictor. Last night or last evening was asked about this a topic of biocast nephropathy. I have to mention very quickly, how does that fit? Just to remind you that this notion of cholemic nephropathy, also called biocast nephropathy, was originally described in patients with obstructive cholestasis, cholangiocarcinoma, pancreatic cancer, Billy goes to 40, the patient get AKI, you put a biliostomy tube, they get better. That was the original obstructive jaundice induced AKI. But now the question becomes, what happens with the patient with cirrhosis? Can they also have it? So the jury is still out on this topic, but I'm gonna show you very quickly evidence supported against it. So starting with this paper by Tony Chunk here in Chicago and a paper in India looking at autopsies. They took patients who had a diagnosis of HRS in the chart, they died, the autopsies, were performed and look at the kidneys and they found bile caps in this tissue. They said, all right, these patients do have parenchymal injury. Maybe that's why they had a KI, not just HRS. And that was also found in an old paper in 1964 from Canada. We also know that, and this is a study that we shared in, in Kidney Week last year, that when you have elevated bilirubin, you're more likely to see renal tubular epithelial cell casts, suggesting some sloughing in tubular cells. So that supports it. And then finally, there's an animal model by Fickert in Austria showing that if you block bile acid receptors, the animals get less injury in this model of common bile duct ligation. Okay, sounds pretty good. What do we have against it? I already showed you the paper with Solomon Pepper where he found 18 out of 22 patients with absolutely normal renal parenchyma. Doesn't fit the biocast story from Tony Chan. We also know from Tony Bade, I show you the autopsy study, I'm sorry, the biopsy, he biopsied 10 patients and found HRS because there was nothing in those kidneys, so that doesn't fit either. Also, we know that this renal tubular epithelial cell cast in the urine can be present even without AKI, suggesting that, yeah, there may be evidence of injury, but that doesn't explain the rising creatinine. It's a separate problem. And finally, there's an animal model that antagonizes the model from the Austrian 
saying that actually bioassays are beneficial to the kidneys. So with this story, we still cannot be really um, able to ascertain the diagnosis of bypass nephropathy and cirrhosis. So I tend to be very conservative and only consider it when everything else has been already ruled out. So I'm going to conclude with this case, which is a little bit of a deviation from the rest of this presentation, but just to kind of point to the breadth of the possibilities in this context. This is a 61-year-old patient, also with alcoholic-induced cirrhosis, that arrives to the hospital with abdominal distension. You can see an evaluation, the labs show a creatinine 3.2, bill is not too bad at 1.9, your analysis shows blood, white cells, UPCR of 4.3 grams per gram, clearly not your classic HRS type of patient. Your microscopy show this very distinct uh, RBC cast with a waxy matrix, so suggestive of a glomerulonephritis. Problem is a lot of these patients, actually the H hepatitis RNA was positive, so we were suspecting, of course, hep C related GN, C3, C4 was decreased. The, the issue with these patients is that a lot of times they're very complicated, they're thrombocytopenic, they're ill. To do biopsies is not as easy. What happened with this gentleman is that underwent paracentesis, creatinine got a little better, subsequently got worse, was treated for HRS anyway, like anybody in the hospital gets the cocktail of moderate and octodite. And eventually the patient ended up requiring dialysis, stayed in the hospital, is Luckily for him, got a liver transplantation about a month into the hospital stay. And after about a month being in a liver transplantation, liver transplanted state, was able to recover kidney function, not only needing dialysis, platelets improved to 165. So about a month later, we biopsied this gentleman and he had still evidence of endocapillary proliferation and MPGN, probably associated with hep C, even though the hep C had already been eradicated by the uh, antiviral therapy. So the patient was treated with retux in, on top of the transplant and anti-rejection medications, progressively improved to 2.7 grams, remained nephrotic for a little bit, until finally three months later, UPCR went down to 0.4. So not only shows that these patients with cirrhosis are also susceptible to glomerular insults, but it's also important to keep track of these patients and not end our assessment at the time of liver transplantation or hospital discharge. We are bringing these patients back, we're biopsying some patients, and we're finding evidence of parenchymal injury and not unusual, uh, and, uh, actually. So I'm gonna summarize uh, this presentation, bring you back this of a newer version of the Venn diagram to highlight to you that the assessment of AKI and cirrhosis is not a three-way process as we have been told for, for years that we have to have a more open approach to the possibilities that they may have. And in terms of treatment, um, I would like to submit to you that basic constrictive therapy should be aim a uh, target map rise of 15 meters of mercury based on the current evidence. We don't have a prospective randomized control trial, which ideally should be done to look at safety, but this is fairly a safe approach in general. Norepinephrine and terlipressin are the most effective isoconstrictors, clearly more effective than modern enoctrotide. And I would ask you to consider the use of diuretics um, as much as you consider the use of albumin in these patients uh, with, as, that are successfully treated with a vasoconstrictor. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Just, just to acknowledge the team at Auctioner that we are been doing these studies for the last five years and the Harmony Consortium led by Andrew Allegretti and Justin Belcher that we're hoping to make some additional contributions in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yes.
Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't think the evidence for fractional excretion of urea uh, is robust enough to replace FINA. There is a paper by Patidar that claimed fantastic results. We have uh, data that we published in Kidney360 about three years ago. We didn't see a fee urea performing better. And more recently, an, another paper by Gauda showed no benefit. Here's the truth. If you have a true HRS, the HRS physiological state is not going to care how much Lasix you take because you're technically not going to be very responsive and your urinary sodium was still going to be low. So th the idea that a diuretic will falsely increase your, your FINA in a true HRS, I think is not correct if we truly think that you are in front of an HRS. The overwhelming majority of patients are already taking spironolactone and you gum with a urine sodium less than 10. So um, I, I'm not necessarily saying that fee urea is uh, inferior, but I don't, it doesn't really help you unmask cases that you would otherwise don't catch with FINA. I think the main message with FINA is that if it's low, you're still under the same question mark. There could be anything. When it becomes helpful, if it's elevated, if FINA of one point plus percent is going to be extremely unlikely to be consistent with HRS and is probably reflective of tubular injury. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Is Yeah, I, I would think that abdominal compartment syndrome is a present in complicating a case of HRS in about 15, 20% of the times. Uh, we looked at this in our center, and I think the numbers were in the teens, where we had diagnosis of HRS. Because remember, when you diagnose HRS, there's nothing in the diagnosis of HRS that is antagonized by the diagnosis of compartment syndrome. And compartment syndrome, you just need to have a blood pressure. So you can have both things present. So I would definitely agree that you're more likely to benefit from continuous decompression than introduce harm to the course of the AKI. Yes, I am very interested. I was, I was actually made aware of that technology uh, not too long ago, and I'm very curious to see trials coming out. I, I am very interested. I think it's a potential for benefit uh, for patients with tensositis for sure. Yes. Yeah, so what I would think, and this is what we, uh, and I say we because I was part of the a meeting earlier this year with the Club of Ascites and the ATKI Consortium invited a few new members, and I was able to participate. Hopefully, we'll come up with some guidelines later this year or next year. And what we're trying to say is we need to get rid of this two-day, close your eyes, give albumin, and then rethink. I think you just have to assess the patient, use the elements that you have, whether to use portal care, ultrasound, echocardiography, physical examination, 
history, clinical judgment, I think it's up to the clinician, but you have to be more, I think the message is that you have to be more judicious and decide if the patient needs albumin, needs nothing, or needs diuretics at presentation. I think it's, it's, it's not, we don't have to put everybody on the same basket. I would say that still in the absence of a clear presence of hypervolemia, the recommendation will continue to be to try albumin just because it's the most common. The most common cause of AKI at the end of the day continues to be hypovolemia, even in this population. Not for us in nephrology. When we get consulted, we are consulted when it's a progressive AKI. We don't get to see the perinals. The perinals were managed by the primary team. When you look at that population, yes, perinal is the most common cause. When the patients arrive to the consultation service, at least in my experience at auctioner and in South Carolina, the most common cause becomes ATN followed by HRS. It's very unlikely that you get consulted and you give more albumin and patients get better. But going back to your question, I would say that there are going to be patients who indeed need albumin, but we should abandon this approach that everybody gets albumin before we think. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's one study in in Australia, since you mentioned that, uh, Danielle, that they uh, sent patients on infusion pumps home with telepressin uh, for up to 12 months. Uh, so. Uh, no. No. Yeah. I I don't think they got albumin. Yeah. Thank you. Sí, sí, sí.